Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. According to the National Institute on Aging, Alzheimer's disease is a brain disorder that slowly destroys memory and thinking skills and eventually the ability to carry out the simplest of tasks. The Institute also states that estimates suggest more than 6 million Americans, most of them age 65 or older, may have dementia caused by Alzheimer's. In this episode, our guest will be Judy Levy, an occupational therapist with over 40 years of experience. She holds a master's degree in allied health education from Rutgers University and is an award-winning author of the book, Activities to Do with Your Parent Who Has Alzheimer's Dementia. While being a dedicated professional helping others, Judy was suddenly faced with managing the care of her own mother, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia. It was a journey that lasted for 10 years. As a caregiver, Judy had to learn how to help her mother navigate her disease and give her the best quality of life while managing her own feelings. This journey inspired Judy to write her book and share with others the lessons she learned along the way as both an occupational therapist and a family member. I'd now like to welcome Judy Levy to our show. Welcome, Judy. Good morning, James. So good to be talking to you. And you are in California, right? I am. I am in beautiful Southern California. I can't quite believe that I live here. We moved here three and a half years ago from New Jersey. Well, you are a uh, fellow New Jerseyan, and uh, I forgive you for moving away (laughs) because I know it's very nice in California. Thank you for joining us. I want to start off, Judy, by asking you, you were from New Jersey. Where in New Jersey were you from and where did you actually grow up? I was born in Newark. I grew up in South Orange. We raised our children in Short Hills and then we moved to California. It's quite a change. The ocean's on an opposite side. Everything is different. I don't know east from west. I don't know names of streets here. I keep driving And you go and you think you know what you're doing and you're on a street that's got the same name as another street. We live in a beautiful area and we've circled around (laughs) a lot. So So I'm glad that you're enjoying it out there. I'd like for you to tell us about your education when you went to school. What did you major in? What were your interests and what drew you to those interests? I got into occupational therapy because my sister, who was a speech therapist, said they do arts and crafts. And I said, oh, I could do that. That might be interesting. (laughs) And I applied for college because arts and crafts seemed interesting. And I like science and I love biology. And I found I like to understand how things worked and I liked crafts. So I started as an occupational therapist from the time, I guess I was 17, and I graduated as an occupational therapist. And then I went to Boston University. It was Sargent College at that time. And they changed the name under the Johnson administration to Sargent College of Allied Health Professions. I was just discussing this with my husband because that became important at the time when Johnson was president that allied health professions started to gain influence within importance in the rehab industry. So um, the school's name changed. And then I went on and got my master's in allied health education teaching so that I might have the opportunity to use it in a classroom. So that's really my background as far as schooling goes. And I've been in OT Ever since, I think like an OT, I am an OT. If you know somebody that's a physical therapist, they think very differently than OTs. They're very much more specific as far as their rehab. OTs are more, how are we gonna get somebody to be functionally independent? So that's my my background. And I'm doing it a long time. I, I just think like that. Just a little more detail for our listeners, if you wouldn't mind. 
when you're talking about occupational therapy, what is it that is trying, what is it that you're trying to accomplish through occupational therapy? Okay. Occupational therapy, we don't find jobs for people. The one thing about being an occupational therapist is somebody says, oh, well, will you get me a job? And the answer is no. Living, occupational therapy is eating, dressing, hygiene, self-care, functional independence as far as living your life, taking care of your checkbook, being able to shop independently, being able to program your home, how to set up a meal, how to do meal planning. It's much more functional in terms of living. If you're talking about occupational therapy in regards to children, and I worked a long time doing developmental training. I worked with Jerry's kids mm -hmm. and I, uh, I did a lot of cerebral palsy. I did a lot of working with a, a camp in New Jersey to establish a program for children with learning disabilities. Um, that didn't exist when I was first coming out of school. You, you had perceptual motor training, but you weren't learning disabled. It's, it's, it, things are the same, but the names have changed. So occupational therapy is still occupational therapy. It's still difficult for people to comprehend. I know what a physical therapist does. What do you do? And the example that I always give people regarding rehab is that a physical therapist will get you walking from point A to point B. They will use modalities, um, wax, heat, electrical stimulation, water, to get muscles relaxed or strengthened to enable your ability to have functional mobility. Occupational therapy will take that functional mobility and apply it to the specific activity. So if your arm is weak following a stroke, the premise is to get your arms stronger so that you can get dressed independently, that you don't have a contracture that's going to limit your functional movement, mobility, and skill level. If you have a stroke and half your body has gone and is not working the way that it did previously, we'll work on equipment so that you can still cut your food, you can still do your buttons, you can still get bathed you can still hook a bra, you can still tie your shoes, all within the limitations that have been inflicted upon you based on your diagnosis of a stroke. And as far as the difference between pediatric is its habilitation, as opposed to when you're older and something, or you don't even have to be older, a traumatic injury or something, it is rehabilitation. So developmentally, you have to understand how a child develops to be able to understand how an adult will have to go back through the sequence to redevelop, to get back certain skills. Oh, that's very clear. So basically you have to understand the extent of that person's injury or disability and also where they're at in their stage of life and what they know and what they don't know at that point. Yes. You've worked with very young. Would you refer them as uh, to them as patients or clients? Pretty much when they were in the hospital, they were patients. If I saw them out of the hospital at a, at a summer camp, or if I saw them in a, in a preschool, or if I saw them in school, or I saw them outside, they were, they were my clients. They were, they were people who I were he was helping for reimbursement purposes. Now you have to call them clients in the hospital. It's a patient. It really were just people who had a limitation at the people time. who needed help, right? But yeah. so the people who needed help, so you had a wide, wide range of people that you've worked with over your career. You mentioned children, people with injuries. Did you do a lot of work with older people? Um, I did a lot of work with older people. But one thing, just in case anybody is looking to be an occupational therapist, the training that you get goes across the entire age spectrum so that you can understand where somebody's at in their independence. I worked, I pretty much I'm not doing direct care at this point. I worked over 40 years in pretty much every kind of setting. I started in an acute care hospital, which was fantastic. I was at New York hospital at that time. It was, it was New York Cornell 
And then I did my training afterwards at Presbyterian. And right now the hospital names change. It's New York, Cornell, New York, whatever it is, they've merged. Yeah. So, um, so that was my initial training following school. The difference in OT now is that you get your degree in something else as an undergraduate and then you get your master's in occupational therapy. The background at the time is that you got your degree in occupational therapy. So I didn't start as a 21 year old learning OT. I was immersed from the time I was 17. And it's, uh, it's different. It's different. You're, you're approaching it from a different time in your life. I really was molded because 17 is really kind of young. And I worked with older people primarily I really like adult rehab, but the field allowed me to do different types of work based on my lifetime. So before I had children, I worked with children. When I wanted to have children, I didn't want to be around only children. When I had young children, I did consulting and I consulted to nursing homes to see about establishing OT programs. When my kids were in school, I went back to work part-time and I was doing outpatient adult rehab part-time. And then I was teaching some classes for the OT component of the home health aid program for nurses in Newark. And then I was doing some at um, Kane. I was going in doing guest lecturing at Kane. And since I've kind of gotten enmeshed in dementia, I've been doing consulting not even consulting, it's more like brainstorming with people to come up with ideas to how they might benefit somebody who has dementia. Because when I was older and my mother got older and got dementia, which she had for 10 years, my focus became adult rehab, dementia. <laughs> so Judy, in 2014, you wrote a book called Activities to Do with Your Parent Who Has Alzheimer's Dementia. You mentioned about your mom getting Alzheimer's. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey that you went on where you were professionally working with people with Alzheimer's dementia to having it sort of, shall we say, hit home for you? Okay. I wrote the book because I had to. If you speak with anybody and they've invented a product or they've written a book or they've done something, something has happened to them that causes them to respond by writing or drawing or singing or doing something that allows them to handle what's going on. As an occupational therapist, I wanted my mother to be purposeful. I wanted the activities to not be juvenile and I wanted the caregiver to be able to do the activity and if the activity was not successful, to be able to recognize that it wasn't successful and come up with a way to look at it objectively to change it. So what started was my mom got diagnosed with dementia and we didn't recognize, it, it, you can be the most brilliant person in the world when something is going on, you may not see it. And I went to pick up my mother to go somewhere and she wasn't there. She was still driving around, having a marvelous time driving. We did not know where, and she did not reappear for a number of hours. And we couldn't locate her because she didn't want a cell phone because she wanted a cell phone. She wanted GPS because she wanted GPS. So she was missing. And when I asked her, where were you? We were supposed to pick you up at 12 and you didn't reappear until eight at night. And her answer was, it's none of your business to question me. Who am I? Mm. And some of the issue with dealing with someone who's first getting dementia is the person's individual reaction is, I'm going to ignore it and pretend it's not happening to me. If your family is not living with you and sees you, and we lived in the next town, I saw her, I spoke with her, she covered great. She was able to hide from us the difficulties that she was having because she didn't admit it. And I don't know if I denied it or I didn't want to see it until it like hit me in the face. Yeah. And when it hit me in the face, it was, 
she made friends with people who had advertisements in the yellow pages. Mm -hmm. And I went to her house and there were strangers in her house and I was crazed. So that kind of was like, okay, (laughs) we have to deal with this now. It's not easy to deal with. So part of recognizing that your parent, and that's the problem with the name of my book and people had pointed out to me, oh, activities to do with your parent. What about if it's your husband? Or what about if it's your brother? What about if it's your child? I was dealing with my parent. So I wrote the book saying parent, but I should have said just activities to do with someone who has Alzheimer's dementia. I did it as a parent because that was my, that was how I saw the world. So going from a professional, we were fortunate that we were able to get somebody to move in with my mother. That was a journey. I bet, <laughs> getting I the person. <laughs> I don't know if you went through that, but getting a person that, that you wanted to deal with was not so easy. I just have to digress. My mother had fallen and broken her hip with the woman. And the woman, she calls me up. I'm not mentioning any names. I'm protecting the innocent. She calls me up and she says, Judy, um, your mother fell, but she's fine. I got her into the house and she's lying down. And I said, why didn't you call? This is the therapist now. Why didn't you call an ambulance? If somebody falls, why did you get them up to walk up the stairs to go inside? Why didn't you just call the ambulance? Well, she's little. I could help her get up and we got her in and she's fine. I said, oh, good. So I had to take her to the doctor and she had a fractured hip and she ended up having surgery and she ended up in a rehab center. When she went in, lo and behold, the caregiver, I asked if the caregiver could stay with my mother in the rehab center. And they said, no problem, bring in her certificates. And we had gotten her through an agency. And they said, oh, gee, you know, we have somebody here who has the same name. And I said, oh. And they said, and we'd like you to speak to our hospital administrator. I said, okay. So it seems that not only did she have the same name, but she had the same social security number. Oh. So we had lots of strange issues. So getting a caregiver that was legally right and appropriately vetted. And when you think you're doing the right thing, you really have to do diligence. We thought we had, and this was a big problem. And they needed to do fingerprinting, which they have since learned to do in conjunction with the the thing. So that was something that I did learn. But um, this has been a journey. So we had live-in care. And part of the problem that I wanted to address in the book was if she set up an activity and then went home and another aide came in, I didn't want the second aid to start all over again with the mistakes that the first aid had done. So the reason that I wrote the book the way that I did is it's an activity followed by an assessment form is it allows the second caregiver to know what happened and what they did to change it. So she's not reinventing the wheel. Let's say the first person decided, oh, we're going to have peanut butter and she's allergic to peanut butter or she hates peanut butter or she doesn't want to eat a sandwich. She writes that down. And then the next person knows, well, I'm not going to give her a peanut butter sandwich because she's not going to do it. So an activity is not just crossword puzzles or painting. An activity is anything you need to do that you're interacting with somebody to get a specific outcome. Getting dressed is an activity. Choosing the sweater that you're going to wear that's appropriate for the weather is an activity. It doesn't have to be we're going to sit down and find all the letter Bs that you can find in the newspaper today. It can be, let's look outside, what's the temperature? You told me it's gorgeous today in New Jersey. Do I need a sweater? Do I need a jacket? Do I wear a sleeveless shirt? What's the temperature? Let's discuss it. Let's go into your closet and make a choice. Which would you like to put on? And then it gets to the level that the person is functioning at for choices. Can they go into a closet and pick something? Or do you have to limit their choice? I have a blue sweater and I have a yellow sweater. Which would you like to wear today? Understood. So this way they're getting a win out of it. They're getting a win and you're getting a win. So basically with dementia, 
is there's so much frustration anyhow that if a person is frustrated, you don't want to add to it. It's just compounds itself. Judy, I understand that your book has won an award. Can you tell us about that? My book won an award. The name of it is Maud's, M-A-U-D-E apostrophe S, Maud's Awards for Innovation in Alzheimer's Care. And the area that I won was in supporting care partners. And it was very exciting. They had just started it in 2020. I was the first recipient of that. And the award was established in honor of Maud. Her family has established this award that they give in different areas of Alzheimer care. It was very exciting to win. They had a whole presentation that was going to be in person and then because of COVID, it wasn't in person. And it was, I will send you a picture of the book with the award. It was a thrilling time. You know, when I was saying to you that you should be recognized for doing something positive. Yes. And this was like, oh my God, look at this. Oh, I won an award. Terrific. So it was very validating and very exciting. And well-deserved. Thanks, James. I wanted to mention that my mother had Alzheimer's like yours did. She had, I don't know if your mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia. Was your mom actually diagnosed with Alzheimer's? She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's is an umbrella and she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia as okay. opposed to Lewy body or some other type. Oh, okay. Well, my mom, again, the first sign, sometimes we miss those things. My mom was probably about 70, maybe 71. And she started losing her keys a lot. <laughs> uh, but that was, you know, hey, I, I misplaced my keys. If I don't have a specific place that I put them, I sometimes forget where they are. But she was losing them a lot. And then one day we were having a, a barbecue, I think it was. And my mother was bringing, I don't know if it was baked beans or something she was bringing to the party. And we see her walking up our road with this bag. And we, you know, mom, where's your car? And she had parked it somewhere and she didn't remember where she parked it. She just was walking up our street with this, this bag of stuff for the barbecue. And that's when we, were, we first got really alarmed. But we probably missed a lot of stuff before that. And then I think you talk about how they can cover it up. And my mom lived in a senior community in West Caldwell, and she had a bunch of friends and she lived in independent living and they covered for her because they really loved her and they protected her. And we started finding out about little things that she was doing that they were covering for her for, and they just sort of came around her, but she ended up staying in independent living probably a good year or two longer than she should have. Uh, and then we sort of had to handle things very quickly. We were in denial a little bit. We, you don't want to see your, your parent cross over to from being the one who cared for us to the one that we have to care for. I mean, I used to enjoy it as a, as a man in my forties, having my mother come up to me and say, button up that shirt. It's cold today. You know, it, it's kind of like neat. Your mother's still mothering you. But all of a sudden the tables were turning and I had to, you know, my wife and I and our family had to become caregivers and that was, that was difficult. Um, but then she was already in a community that was continued care. So there was a lot more assistance in that area, but it was still a, a big adjustment for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I hear you talking about it and I'm hearing about uh, the inspiration to your book and some of the things that you talk about. What are some other things uh, you mentioned about day-to-day -day activities so that those activities can become a win for the, the caregiver, you know, the family, or for actually the person themselves? What other things would be kind of activities that you might consider doing for a specific person? Okay. Um, it depends what level of dementia somebody's at. So I, I just... They'll tell you that anytime you've met somebody with dementia, you've met one person with dementia and that everybody is individual. No two people are the same and no two people with the diagnosis of dementia are the same. So an activity that might be good for your mom may not be good for my mom. Mm -hmm. So 
my mother loved words. She loved words. She loved the New York Times crossword puzzle in ink. She was exceptionally smart woman who had a sense of style. And I couldn't do something with her that didn't reflect her interest. That was her, she was a card player. And one of the things that I use as an example in the book, and I have mentioned in the past, is she was a master's level bridge player. Really? Oh, yeah. boy, that's challenging. It is. I don't play bridge. So more <laughs> power to her. She was a, <laughs> so she played bridge. So as she had dementia, her functional level went from bridge to we would play gin and we would have contests who would win in gin. And then she couldn't play gin. So we played um, war and then she couldn't do war. So then we did, let's sort the cards by color. And then we did, let's sort the cards by suit. And then let's put them from, find all the kings, find all the aces. So what we did with an activity, and in this case, the activity was cards because she liked cards. We adapted the level of what she was able to do to the level she was capable of doing. Right. So I adjusted it down so that she was succeeding. And I could write that down on my assessment sheet that this is what we got to, this is working. So if you sit down and you want to play gin with her, it's not going to work for you. So you want to be able to assess objectively. It's very hard to deal objectively with your parent. You don't want to see them not able to succeed. Mm. Um, emotionally, she, if I was on the phone with her or my sister was on the phone with her, we sound very much the same. She could tell the difference who she was speaking with by just our voices. When she saw us, she didn't know who we were. So auditory, you know, whatever the word is, auditorially, <laughs> maybe that <right>. works. <laughs> okay, she could she could tell, but physically, I wasn't ten anymore. I was a whole lot older, so I wasn't the same person. So she didn't recognize me visually that she did by sound. Oh, and voice, that, so she knew your voices. She knew our voices, but she didn't recognize our voice in relation to our person as we got older. So um, that was interesting. And the day that she didn't know who I was, was a day that I made a major mistake and the caregiver really, she let me have it. I was very upset that my mother didn't know who I was. And I kind of went into the room and I'm like, gangbusters, hi, mom, it's Judy and I'm here. And my mother says, oh, it's so nice to see you. I said, do you know who I am? That was my mistake, number one. And she said, no. And I said, hi, mom. And I went to give a little clue again. And she said, no. So I said, well, and the caregiver was behind her shaking her head. Who do you think I am? And she looked at me and she says, are you my aunt? And then I like got a hold of myself and I said, that's exactly who I am. And I'm so glad to be here today, but I just blew it. And it's like, you you have to listen to what you're doing. And part of it was what I wanted her to, I wanted her to know that I was still her daughter. Yeah. And it's, dementia is very hurtful to the caretakers. Mm. Um, it's not as hurtful to the individual once they get into dementia because they just, they don't know anymore. Mm. But for the person taking care of the individual, it's hard and it's hurtful, and it's not anybody's fault. And you have nobody to blame because it's just happening in somebody's brain. I go along with that 100%. You know, we had a little, little bit of a dry run with my mother's mother. She, she also had dementia. It wasn't as uh, drastic. Um, perhaps, you know, her, her heart gave way maybe um, a little earlier on in the progression of the disease so that uh, she didn't get as bad as my mother got. But uh, we remember seeing my grandfather interact with her and he, he would get very impatient with her. It's like he didn't really understand. He didn't want to know. 
So he would be correcting her. No, that's not her name. No, Do he used to call her Dolly. No, Dolly, that's not the person's name. That's not right. I didn't tell you that. And we all would be thinking, oh, Grandy, just, she doesn't know. She can't help it, you know? And he just didn't want to lose her is what was happening, but he was sort of denying it. So when my mom started, we tried to bear that in mind, but it was still tough because, you know, I'm her, I'm her son. I want her to still be my mom. Right. And uh, it was really difficult. I know there were times when, you know, you, you're you hurting because I remember one time my mom, she was, she had just gone into skilled nursing. It was, she kind of made that big step down a little late in the process. But I remember we, we got her, her supper and put it out in front of her. And she said, um, oh, are we going to say our prayers now? Just like a little girl um, waiting for me to say prayers with her. Like I was, I was her dad. And that's, that got me to, broke me up because I thought she used to lead me to do that. And now it was the other way around. And it was like, right. oh, you just, you don't want that role as a, a, you know, it's your, it's your parent. You just don't want to be in that role, but you've, you've got to, you got to apply some of the things that you're talking about in your book to actually have that relationship, you know, that you can have a relationship. You just have a different relationship. Yes. It's just a different relationship. I think the thing that might have been harder for your, it's your grandfather. Yeah. Was the time that he was in, Alzheimer was not as prevalent and it wasn't as written about, it wasn't as known and it wasn't, the resources to help you deal with it didn't exist. Mm. So now I, I hate to say that it's better, but because so many people have dementia, but at least they're aware of the Alzheimer Foundation, or the you know the resources within your community, all across the country, all across the world, and this is not a, a localized thing. This is this is a worldwide issue of dementia. And how many millions of people are dealing with it? When you're dealing with it, you think you're the only one dealing with it, and that that's one of the major things. If somebody is struggling with somebody getting dementia, is reinventing the wheel. And pretty much, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are resources you can call up locally, wherever you are in the United States, you can call up the Alzheimer's Foundation, the Alzheimer's Association, and get resources right where you are. And people, if you've been, if you've dealt with dementia, either personally or professionally, all you really want to do is help somebody. It, the friends that you have can change as you have your relative loved one with dementia. So people that you thought were exceptionally supportive of you may not be, and they may not stay your cohorts because they don't want to be involved with the issue of dementia. They don't want to listen to you quetching about what's going on with your family and what you have to deal with. So your support structure will get smaller, right? in which case you have to look to what else is available for you. And there, there's so much available to you. A friend of mine right now has a friend whose son is in Baltimore and we're out here in California and the son's, he has early onset dementia. Oh no. He is a surgeon and he is in his 50s and he's got children that are in college and he can no longer practice <laughs> and how do you how do you deal with that so whatever resources i've come across in my journey i've given to her to give to a friend and then made myself available to speak with her if she wants to talk to me i'll certainly speak with somebody sure but there's different things at different times in the person's level of dementia. So if it's the very beginning and they're denying, you have to just think safety, but basically you have to get your paperwork into place when they're still competent because they have accounts, they have history, they have financial history, they own a house, they may own a car, they may have assets that you have to plan for who's in control. If 
you have nobody have control of your um, power of attorney or your medical power of attorney or your financial power of attorney or your DNR or whatever, all that paperwork should be put into place now. I mean, we've done it. I'm not yet, hopefully, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not exhibiting signs of dementia, but I would, we have prepaid our funeral. We have done all our medical thing. We moved to California and all the forms changed. So where you have wills in New Jersey, you have trusts in California. So things are different based on what state you're in. But the issue is try and make your plans before you get sick so that when you're sick, you don't have to deal with it. So yes, because one of the things I know, we, we fortunately did do the power of attorney thing, the medical power of attorney, and we, were, we had uh, the ability to take care of our finances and, and all that ahead of time when she was able to sign the paperwork right. and all that. I think having that in place, even though it's extra work, there's things that have to be done and bills that have to be paid and all that, at least there's not the stress of what do you do? This needs to get paid and my mom's not capable of writing a check. Right. You know, so, that's, that's worse. That's way worse than just having to do it. Right? right. Judy, the occupational therapist would deal with balancing and running your home. That is a different level of independent functioning as opposed to someone who has dementia and we're still dealing with the same issue of who's writing the check and who's capable of writing the check and the person is no longer able to do it. So just in terms of um, the forms have changed, there's a form now called a POLST, P-O-L-S-T form, and that really follows you into the hospital. Your internist, you can discuss that with your doctors. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've put on my LinkedIn page is a little blurb on your cell phone. So when I started as an OT, cell phones didn't exist. I was happy to have a landline that had a cord long enough to let me go in another room. But the cell phone, and we had a hard time leaving our flip phone, but the cell phone, I have contacts listed in my cell phone. And my contacts have emergency people to contact. Okay, so here's something for you. Okay. okay. In my name, I put all of my medical information, allergies, what I am taking, whatever. So if you happen to pick up my phone and you go to my name, you can get my medical information. By the same token, on my husband's name in my phone, I can go to him under my contacts. I listed all of his allergies, medications, doctors, doses under his name. So when he went into the hospital, I had all of his information in my phone. Oh, okay. By the same token, in his phone, he's got his information as well as my information. So just as a thing for anybody who's listening, you should have the information for yourself and for your spouse mm -hmm. or your child that you're responsible in your phone because that's where people are looking. Wow, that's a great idea. That's a great uh, piece of information to pass on to people. You know, because one of the th when you're dealing with a crisis, whether that person is being rushed to the hospital or a decision has to be made or what have you, you don't need the added stress of not being able to find the information you need, right? Right. Oh, that's great. My mother had broken, she had broken her hip a second time, which ended up, she ended up dying if, as a result of that. That was kind of like the the end she was 98 and she she just her her hip just went but when she was in the hospital i called my sister and i'm getting it confused the the okay. first time she broke her hip we were in atlantic city and governor christie declared a state of emergency because it was a polar vortex do you, I don't know if you remember, I do remember that. that. Yes, I and do. And he closed all the roads. So we were in New Jersey and my mother was in, she was in West Orange at that time. And um, she had a caregiver and I called up my sister and said, mom's fallen. She needs an ambulance, 
I got a call from the caretaker. She needs an ambulance. I'm stuck in South Jersey and I can't get back. Do you have all the forms to give to the EMT when they come to the house? And she said to me, I have everything. It's in the safe in the bank. Oh, well, that's lovely. But it was a Saturday and the bank was closed. Oh, no. So you can't assume that you'll get the information unless you have the information. So the other piece of information, like taking a picture of your COVID vaccine and having it on your phone, <laughs> a very you good take idea. A picture of your your financial, your medical power of attorney, your DNR, whatever it is, and put it with their name so that you have photographs that you can call up to give to the people. Wow. Yeah, that is excellent advice, Judy. I really, I really appreciate that. And I'm sure our listeners who, who may have a, a relative or a friend, you know, in that situation would be glad to get that information. Now, as you were going through this process with your mom, and here you are, you're the occupational therapist professionally, and you're, but you're also now learning probably some new things about Alzheimer's dementia with your own mom. What kind of impact did your mom's condition have on you personally and professionally? Hmm. You never let it go. You can be home and your mom can be cared for somewhere else. It's on your head all the time. Hmm. It doesn't, it really doesn't go away. I had written an article that I talked about my 11 lines. I, I don't know if you can visualize it. They're, they're smoother now. I didn't get Botox, but they're smoother. But it was, <laughs> it was like all the time I had my eyebrows were like really tight together and people would say, are you angry? And I would say, no. Are you sure you're not angry at me? You look angry. And I, you can see it on people's faces. It, my mother's decline into the, the world of dementia was very hard on all of us. Um, I'm the child. There's three of us. I am the one that got to deal with the primary. Mm. I, I was it. As a therapist, I wanted to make it better. When I was a therapist working in hospitals, at the end of the day, I go home and the problems that I saw in the hospital were left in the hospital. They were somebody else's problems. I didn't live them when I left work. When I was with my mother, you live it 24 seven. You don't know when you're gonna get a phone call. It doesn't go away and it doesn't get better. And the journey of Alzheimer's is very difficult. And it just, it's with you. My mother died now, she died at the age of 98, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so it's much easier now. I mean, life is, I don't have the stresses of worry. I'm not responsible for her living day to day. It's not like dealing with an infant. And um, not that she was infantile at all. I mean, it's just that the, the constant care, making sure that constantly it's okay. I don't have that now. So life is much easier and consequently, at this point, I don't remember her sick. I remember her vibrant. So I'm sure you have that with your mother. You don't remember the sickness. You remember the neat, good, healthy stuff. Exactly. So yeah, yeah. we do, as a matter of fact. But I do remember those days near the end when we would go to to visit her and, you know, be at least a couple of times a week, if not more, because it was fairly, it was local. It was the same town we were in. You know, some days we would see her, she'd be sort of sitting, sitting there with her head down and, you know, there could be a little food down her front or whatever. And I think of my mom as this vibrant World War II veteran, Royal Air Force veteran, uh, survived, yeah. survived the Blitz in London, uh, just this, this amazing, well-read person. She didn't even graduate high school, but she was very well-read and, uh, just a very vivacious person there she was so it was kind of it was heartbreaking to see that but you know we did try to find i wish we had i wish we had your book at the time i really do we tried to do things we used to bring dunkin donuts in and we would bring bring her a cup of tea and then we started noticing people were gravitating towards our table because we bought the 
the little <laughs> donut. Uh, so we ended up having like a little group of people and they were all, most of them were in the same boat sort of, right? They didn't really, they were pretty far along. You know, we became a smash hit. And of course we were my mother's people. I mean, my mother did, did forget who I was. It did come down to that. Like with you, she didn't know who I was. She remembered my wife. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but didn't remember me, but she knew I was somebody close to her and she became popular because we were there and we were her people and um, we were bringing donuts. One time I laugh a little, you have to laugh a little bit at some of the stuff because you'll go crazy if you don't, but it was the 4th of July and they were having fireworks at a local football field. And we were really close to the football field. They had a little balcony. We went out there with my mom to watch the fireworks and we brought our donuts out there. Well, the next thing you know, there were about seven or eight <laughs> of the people out there with us and we were eating donuts. Not one of them was watching the fireworks at all, but they were having the best time of their lives out there with their donuts. Yeah. And we, we walked out that night, Kelly and I, we looked at each other and said, I, I think we just did something good. We, we did something good. We were at that level. We weren't like, hey, come on. Look. You know, a couple of times we said, look up and they wouldn't. And we just said, that's forget it. We're just out here. And they just had a good time. You can't over expect and force someone to have an experience that they're frankly not going to have. You know, well, they're, at that point, they're not necessarily capable of it. Exactly. Um, I was speaking with one woman who told me that all she wanted to do was take her mom to the community Christmas tree pageant. Yes. And the Christmas tree pageant must have had 80 different de decorated Christmas trees. And it was something that they did. And it was wonderful. And she loved it. And she looked forward to it. And she, this was something she had to do. And um, her mother just couldn't handle that anymore. I mean, how do you take somebody in where all the children and all the noise and all the tumult and everything going on and 80 trees and all the lights, you have to be able to step back and look at what you're doing. And if you have one Christmas tree that's in the town square, that's perfect. If you have one small Christmas tree that you get a pre-made tree and you put it on your countertop and you decorate or you work the week before to do specific ornaments you're going to put on your tree, you're going to string popcorn, you're going to do cranberries, you're going to do something, that's enough. And where you're remembering what happened then, they're not. So where you gave donuts, you were the stars. Wow. That was perfect. It's an in the moment, perfect activity. That's an activity. That's perfect. Perfect activity. Yeah, well, we just, we sort of stumbled upon it that night and we just started finding that our budget for donuts was going up every month because <laughs> we didn't have enough to go around, you know? Uh, yeah. The coffee, we weren't so sure about because you didn't know who might spill it or whatever, but we knew, you know, nobody told us we couldn't bring in the donuts, so we brought them in and nobody was worse, worse for wear, but uh, it was a, it was a good experience. And like you said, and what you talk about in your book, there's things that you can do to have more of those types of experience and have more time with that person and have them benefit from those activities. And as, as you said, as a caregiver, somebody who, who is invested in and deeply concerned about the person with the, the dementia, there's a reward in that as well, is what you're telling us. That the, Absolutely. Yeah. And the reward really, it's good for the person. It's necessary for the caregiver yeah. because it validates what the caregiver is doing and it stops burnout. Because if you're never recognized as doing something that's successful, you just don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. And if you have somebody that is good at taking care of your person in today's vernacular for your peeps, that's the best. That's the yeah. best. And if you lose people after you've invested your time and your energy and your care and their care, it's, it's just, it's terrible. You know, the, the caregiver, it's very easy to allow one family member to take over. It's very difficult for one family member to take over. Yeah, it's true. Part of the skill is allowing somebody else to help take care of the person. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. And, you know, to your point earlier, while it was hard to see my mother's decline towards the end, we do talk all good stuff about her now, all the 
the uh, when I say good stuff, I mean back when she was herself, back when she was my mom and healthy and mind and body. And, and my mother was a sweet person. And we had one time where I just want to address this one last thing with you. With Alzheimer's, at least what I saw with my mom, my mom was a was a very kind, sweet lady. That was her disposition. She was very friendly. She had a little feisty side to her, but she was very friendly, very diplomatic and things like that. We had one time where my mother, we, we were bringing her home from my brother's house and she didn't want to get into the car to go home. And I said, mom, now come on, we got to get you home. You know, you, you got to get in the car in order to get home. And she cursed at me. My mother, my mother and I never had a harsh word ever. And I almost never heard my mother curse at all. And she cursed at me and I was so wounded. I was like, mom, you know, how could you? And the thing is, when we got her back to where she lived, she tried to pull away from me. She was really upset with me. And I thought, well, you know, who, who are you? Whatever. You know, the, the next day we saw her, she was just fine and friendly as ever. But I think some, some, as you said, everybody's different. Each person is different. But do you find that even when you're working with patients that sometimes they can go through periods where they, they do get angry, their personality changes a little bit on and off. Do you find that? Or have you found that? I, what's so interesting is people are just people mm. and they have good days and they have bad days. The problem with dementia is that you may not be able to express what it is that's bothering you. Yeah. And um, she could have looked at the car and she could have been afraid of the car. Yeah, or she could have looked at it was, she recognized it was the wrong color. She wanted to be there. She was frustrated. Did you hear what she said? Um, so it, because part of it gets to how difficult it is for them to say, gee, I don't want to go home yet. Yeah. I'm not ready to go home. Yeah. Um, the question is, is why is somebody doing what they're doing and how can I find what they're doing? Not just what I want, because what, what I want doesn't matter anymore. You're in what they want. And I think anybody's personality could change in a, in a split second. You see that all across the country, but with dementia, you kind of, you're taking care of them, you're doing it and you want to get going and they're not ready. And the question was, how about we wait five more minutes or let's walk to the corner and then come back. Maybe the car would, pick us up when we get back. I need a ride. So it's how you handle that. I think it's so, it's, it's almost wonderful that they're asserting themselves. It's almost awful <laughs> that they're asserting themselves. So um, it's kind of like love, hate kind of thing. Ma, get in the car. And it's like, no. So it's almost, it's when you're dealing with a four-year-old and you go, come on, I got to get to school so that you're not late. And it's like, no. It's the same obstreperous kind of behavior that they're asserting their independence. And okay, you don't want to get in the car. We're not going to get in the car yet. Yeah. So, and then the thing with my mother was, oh boy, I went in one time and she was really, I'll be sweet in my language. She was really angry at me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the best thing about her dementia at that point was I left the room and I came back in and I pretended it was a new day. And I said, hi, and we started all over and she didn't remember any of the anger. And it was like, okay, this worked out fine. So give yourself time to step back and you can physically step back. You can like emotionally step back. But sometimes when it's like you want to scream because you cannot rationalize with somebody who's incapable of rationalizing, you have to back up and approach it from the other side. Oh my God, this door is terrible. I hate this car door. Try this one. It might be better. And yeah. that may be all that it takes is not getting into the same position. I don't know. And if it doesn't work, write it down. It didn't work. This is what happened on Thursday. This was terrible. I don't know what triggered her, but something triggered my mother here when we went to go get in the car. This is what I did. And this worked. Helpful information. It really is. And, and, you know, writing it down and maybe sharing it with other caregivers, as you pointed out before, is so important because you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Somebody else doesn't have to go through that, ex that same experience and get the same reaction. They can try the same reaction. Yeah. That is great. You know, Judy, this has been so helpful. And 
you know, you bring your professional knowledge and experience and your personal experience to this conversation. And as somebody who went through it myself, uh, I look back now and think of some of the things I could have really done differently. And maybe my family could have done differently. But also, you kind of affirmed that some of the things we did do were were the right things to do. And uh, I'm happy to hear that as well. And I know we love our, our parents, our family, or whoever it is that we're caring for. And uh, we want to do right by them because, you know, they're our loved ones. They're people we love. And I'm a member of the, the baby boom generation. And I know that there's a lot of us, sadly, there's going to be a lot of people affected by this disease in one way or another. And to have this information at our fingertips and to be able to, to actually find ways that we can have relationships that are meaningful and helpful to the person suffering from dementia. But uh, I want to thank you so much for being on our podcast. But I also want to ask you, first of all, how can people get a copy of your book? The book is printed on demand. So it's printed, if you order it, it's on Amazon. It's also ordered through Barnes and Noble online but it is printed when you order it. So it's not that a library has it or a bookstore has it, it's from Amazon. The name of it is Activities to Do with Your Parent Who Has Alzheimer's Dementia. My name is Judith A. Levy, E-D-M-O-T-R. It's also available on Kindle and it is available too on Kindle Unlimited, which I don't understand exactly how that works, but you can, read the book. If you have, if you are a member of Kindle Unlimited, it gives you access to all kinds of books that are on Kindle. So also, if you go to Google the book, the picture of the book will come up and it will give you sample pages available so that you can see and get an idea if it's a book that you want to buy. And uh, so there's sample pages and how my brain works. It's kind of like it's an activity. And it shows some of the ways to change the activity. And then it's followed by an assessments sheet for each activity. The other thing, it's got room by room safety instructions that are in there. It's got resources on Alzheimer resources that you could find to help yourself. And it also has questions to consider asking the doctor when you first get a diagnosis on um, what you should do initially because sometimes the book is very good for a different time frame. There are activities for when pers a person is further affected by dementia. So initially it would be activities to, to get yourself situated for when you first recognize that there's a problem to help yourself. Yeah, that's good to hear that about, the, about when you first recognize, because I think um, I'm sure you were like, we were kind of deer in the headlights when we got the official diagnosis and kind of knew what was ahead for us, or we had an idea. We didn't truly know what was ahead of us, but we kind of <laughs> know what the general outcome was going to be. And to have some information about that is, is also terrific to have. Judy, are there other ways that people can find out more about you and, and what you're up to today? You can go onto my LinkedIn and it would just be the name of the book. If you go onto the book at LinkedIn and you have my name, then you can look up my name. And on Facebook, the name of the book. My daughter handles that because she's <laughs> more adept. Got it. Got it. <laughs> what can I tell you? That's not my skill. So, um, yeah. The, the one thing that I will suggest to the people that are listening to this is if you first get a diagnosis for your family member or whomever, get everybody in your family together to write down the questions that they have so that everybody gets input into what questions are asked of the doctor. The second thing is you can ask the doctor or you can actually tell the doctor that you're going to record your visit so that when you ask the questions, you're recording the answers so that when your loved ones, your family members say, what did the doctor say? and you don't remember because it's an overwhelming time, you have the ability to play back what it is that the doctor said. So try and get everybody's input so that nobody feels excluded and try and get it on tape so that you can hear it again later because you 
I promise you, you think you will remember everything and you will be very stressed and you may not remember anything. No, you're right. You're right. And we, we had that same experience where we, when the doctor would come and speak to us about my mom, we always made sure that there was at least a couple of us in the room. So somebody could sort of ask questions. The other one was writing things down or at least there to verify what the doctor said when we got out of the room. Cause you know, you walk out of there and you're just like, you just, you just heard certain things, but you don't remember everything. Right. Unless you have somebody else there or you're writing them down, but that's excellent advice, Judy. Thank you so much for that. Do you have any other projects maybe that are ahead of you? No. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to enjoy California is what you're going to do. <laughs> uh, we're happy to be, we're just enjoying living and we're living. Thank you again, Judy. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank Kelly. Okay. Bye. So for all of our listeners, keep discovering and telling stories that inspire you and others. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. Please subscribe, share, and check out our website at yourhistoryyourstory.com for episode notes and bonus content. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.